Okay, so we were talking about we're talking about the um, how to calculate. Uh, please, can you guys hear me? Yeah. 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 Okay. So we were talking about how to calculate the clearance. Okay. And I'm saying that the calculation of the clearance is giving us an idea of the glomerular filtration rates. Okay. And that is a measure of how well the glomerulus is functioning. Okay. So that's the reason why we are going through all these things. So now let me let me go by it again. So Let's, let's assume, you see, the reason why we are using creatinine is that creatinine is produced in your own body, okay? So it's, it's like a drug which is produced in your own body. So when you, you urinate, it also comes out, okay? So if we want to measure someone's um, glomerular filtration rates, okay, on the world, all we do is that we allow the person or we take 24-hour urine Okay, of the person, the person's 24 hour urine. So the whole 24 hours, how much urine has been produced? When, when we get this urine, then we, we, we take sample of the urine and find the concentration of the urine. Okay, then as we are doing this, we also take the person's blood sample and measure the person's, uh, uh, the concentration of creatinine in the person's serum. So, so let, let's assume um, the, 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 concentra the concentration of, okay, this, this is con um, creatinine, okay, in serum, yes. Okay, so we me measure this thing. Then the next thing we do is that we take the urine, okay, let's say this, this is the person's urine, okay, this is the person's urine, and um, within 24 hours, so what we are going to do is that when we take this urine, we, we measure the volume of the urine, okay? Then we find the concentration of creatinine in the urine, okay? So this is, the U stands for urine. So this is the volume of the urine. So I'm saying that in order to go about this formula, okay, but we are not interested in the in the volume of the urine, but we are interested in the flow rate of the urine. So the flow rate of the urine means that, okay, let's say from the question, in 24 hours, okay, let's say in in 24 hours, the person urinated 2,000 for. Uh, um, let, let's assume the person urinated. Okay, let's use the question. Uh, 2,160 males, okay? So in order to calculate the urine flow rates, just divide this by 24 hours, okay? But convert the 24 hours to minutes. Okay, so that, that's the first thing you do. Don't use the urine raw like that. Always convert the urine into the urine flow rates, okay? And that will give you, from the question, 1.5 males per minute. Okay, then the next thing you do is that once I now have the, the urine flow rates, which is, which is 1.5, okay, Th this is the 1.5. And we got it from here. And we got it by dividing the total urine volume in 24 hours, divided by 1440, which is 24 hours in minutes, okay? Okay, we, we divided them. Good. So we are going to we are going to multiply this by and th this is the this is the volume flow rate. The the view over here is the volume flow rate. And then the u, that's the v. The u the v is the volume flow rate. The u over here is the concentration of creatinine in the urine. Okay. And then the question gave us 7.5 millimoles per liter. Okay. But um we want them to be in the same unit, okay? So you convert it to 
0.27500 micromole per liter. So when I multiply this by this, then I will divide it by the plasma um, creatinine concentration, okay? So as I said, there are two concentrations that we are looking at. The one from the urine, this one, and then the one from the, from the plasma, which is this one. So multiply the urine flow rates by the, the urine concentration and divide by the plasma concentration, okay? And here, we are getting 75 uh, mils per minute, okay? So this means that within one minute, okay, the liver filters 75 mils of water. So now, assuming that, as I said, the normal range is from 90 to 120, okay? So with this, you can say that the person is having a renal failure because the JFR is less than the normal. So this is how we are able to tell whether someone has renal failure or not, okay? Good. Now, we, we use the GFR mainly to calculate for chronic renal failure, okay? Chronic renal failure, that's the, the, the GFR. Good. Let me see. So now, let me show you something. So with, with the question, okay, with, with this same question, um, let, let me erase everything. With, with this same question, they are saying that, let's assume that when um, the nurse was measuring the urine, okay, she told us that the urine was co collected in um, 17 hours instead of 24 hours. So you see, it's, it's going to affect the calculation because when we are calculating the, the urine flow rate, we are going to use 17 hours, okay? Okay, so let's look at the question. So you say that if an error in the time collection was reported to be 17 hours, okay, how, how does this affect the GFR? So it's going to affect the GFR because in the calculation over here, we are going to use 17 hours instead of the 24 hours. Okay, and, and that's going to give us the volume flow rate to be 2.1 mils per minute, okay? And when, when we do the calculation, we are going to get something like 105 mils per minute, which is normal, okay? So just because the person misinterpreted the time, we are getting different values for the GFR. And then now you say that, oh, this patient is fine, whereas the patient has um, um, a renal failure, okay? So that's the reason why when you are collecting the urine, the time factor is very important. Okay, if you are collecting over 24 hours, you collect it over 24 hours because you are going to use it in the calculation. Okay, please, is, is this point clear so far? Um, please, is it clear? I need a response. Yes, please. From... Okay, good. Yes. Okay, good. So let's... Let, let's look at this concept. Let's go a bit up. Okay, so, so we've seen how to calculate the GFR being the urine concentration times the urine flow rate divided by the plasma concentration. Okay, and usually the substances that we use to calculate GFR, okay, are these substances, inulin. But Inulin is an exogenous compound, okay? So we only use it for research purposes. But for an, a normal human being, okay, because your body, which your muscles produce the protein called creatinine, we can just use creatinine straight away for the calculations, okay? Um, without injecting the body with any inulin for the person to react to it. Good. So um, we've seen this. The, the normal values between 8 to 120, but usually we say 120. Okay, GFR, 120 mils per minute, good. Now, there are two compounds that I want to talk about, creatinine, which I've already spoken about. Creatinine is produced by the muscles, okay? So anything that causes muscle to, to get damaged 
you get increased creatinine level. Okay, when you talk about urea, urea is from ammonia, okay? And urea is produced in the liver. Urea is produced in the liver, okay? Uh -huh. So, um, um, let's see. So, if you take in any food with a lot of proteins, okay, you are going to produce a lot of, of urea, okay? Because the proteins will eventually, the, the proteins have nitrogen, which is converted to ammonia, okay? And the ammonia is converted to, to, to how do you call it, urea. So if you have high levels of, um, if you have high levels of proteins, then you have high levels of urea. Okay, good. Not only that, if you have GI bleeding, okay, if you are bleeding in, in your intestines, okay, uh, that, that one too can increase your, your, your urea levels. Okay, so let's remember that. Now, urea and creatinine are excreted by the kidneys. So if you also have kidney problems, you have, um, how do you call it, renal failure, whether acute renal failure or chronic renal failure, you realize that your urea levels will increase as well as your creatinine levels will also increase because now the kidneys cannot excrete it. Okay, good. So that's the point um, over here. So now, there. Yeah, if, if if we ask you to to do a renal function test, okay, you'll be hearing that oh, someone is going to do a renal function test. So what does this entail? One, it entails measuring the GFR. Okay. Two, it entails measuring the person's serum urea levels and serum creatinine levels, because if your kidneys are fine, they are going to excrete this. Okay. If your kidneys have problems, you realize that the person's urea levels have gone up. So if you are reading a patient's lab report on the, on the renal function, and you said the urea levels are high, the creatinine levels are high, then in your mind, you know that no, something is wrong with this patient's kidney, okay? Now, now so between, between GFR and then serum creatinine level, the question is, which one is more sensitive to someone with kidney damage, okay? And the answer is GFR. This is because from, you can look at the side. In the relationship between the GFR and then serum creatinine level, okay, the GFR must fall below 50%, okay, before you can get significant rise in the serum creatinine level. So, the, so, Let's assume the, the patient's renal function is failing, okay? But until the GFR gets to about 50% of it, you are not going to see any rise in the serum creatinine. So if you are waiting for the patient's serum creatinine levels to elevate before you make the diagnosis, you, you waste a lot of time, okay? So the GFR is, is more sensitive than the um, serum creatinine. Okay, now the third thing you are going to look at is proteinuria okay so so let, let me just summarize everything we are looking at the glomerular function okay the glomerular function and you see that one way of checking how well the glomerulus is working is by measuring the person's gfr okay good now the second uh, method of measuring the person's GF, um, the person's glomerular function is proteinuria, where you have proteins in your urine. The normal glomerulus will not allow proteins to leak out, okay? Proteins like albumin, okay? So if you find that there, there are significant proteins in the person's urine, then the person's glomerulus is not working well, okay? Now, um, we use the dipstick to measure proteinuria, okay? And with the dis dipstick, okay, you can get, um, um, it gives the semi-quantitative semi um, measurement, okay? So you'll be hearing that, oh, someone has proteinuria plus one, plus two, plus three. 
okay and you should know the values for all these if you say someone has proteinuria of class one okay it means that the person in in the person's urine you have less than 300 um, milligram in 24 hours okay so it's either they use 300 milli milligram or 0 0.3 grams in 24 hours so that is you you get that as um plus one okay then if you have so it's like this is 0 0.3 one and three okay so 0 0.3 is plus one one is plus two and then three is plus three okay uh, you can review your notes for that okay so we are we are done with the glomerular function now let's go to the tubular function so for the glomerular yeah. function I said that can I please over the dipstick you, you said can I please go over the plus one plus yeah. two so if you hear that someone has a, a plus one proteinuria okay it means that the person has 0 0.3 grams of proteins in 24 hours okay so 0 0.3 grams per 24 hours okay and then plus two is one one gram in 24 hours and plus um, three is when you have more than three grams in 24 hours okay so it's just it, we are just using one and three so 0 0.1 one and three okay good now if if you have if the proteins is less than 300, okay, we call that one the micro um, albuminuria, okay? That's if you have less than 300, okay? It's micro. If you have more than that, it's macro. Okay, now, as I said, you, you get proteinuria if you have problem with the, with the glomerular basement membrane okay and remember that all the diseases you, you guys talked about the glomerular nephritis okay all those things affect the glomerulus and can lead to proteinuria okay good so these are these are the, the test functions for the glomerulus now we are going to see how we test for the tubules the tubular function mm -hmm. for the tubular function we've, we've already talked about them Okay, the functions of the tubules are mainly two or even three. So the first one is uh, dilution or concentration of urine. Okay, and the second function of it is um, um, acid base regulation. So these are the two major functions of the tubules. So if you, if you are talking about tubular function, you want to find out whether the tubules can concentrate urine or not or whether the tubules can excrete h plus ions or not so if you have a lot of h plus ions in your system can the tubules secrete the h plus ion so these are what is called the tubular functions okay good so now um, there's there's a, a concept here that I want to to bring before we move on. What's called the urea creatinine ratio. Okay, so if if you say the urea creatinine ratio is high, it means that you have more urea than creatinine. Okay, so anything that can lead to increase urea levels will increase the urea creatinine ratio. And I and I mentioned some of them. For someone who takes in a lot of protein, you have high urea. Someone with gene eye bleeding, you have high urea levels. Someone with dehydration, you have high urea level. Okay, someone with muscle wasting, okay, or amputation, all these ones, you have urea levels. Um, high urea to creatinine level. Now, I said that the creatinine is produced by mass, um, the creatinine is produced by the muscles, okay? So if, if you have muscle wasting and amputation, You've, you've taken chunk of the muscles away. So in this case, the creatinine levels are reduced. Okay, so, so if the creatinine levels are reduced, then the urea to creatinine ratio will increase. So you know that for one, two, three, four, five, 
okay, it's actually as a result of increased urea levels. But for this, the muscle wasting and then the amputation is because you've, you have reduced the muscle bulk, so the creatinine levels have reduced, and hence the urea to creatinine ratios are high. Okay, and anything that decreases urea production will reduce the urea creatinine ratio. One, low protein intake, dialysis. When you do dialysis, okay, you remove a lot of proteins, okay, and someone with severe liver disease, as we said, the liver is the site of production of urea. So if you have severe liver disease, you can produce a lot of urea. Okay, good. Now, let's, let's look at urine concentration. So we want to test whether a person can concentrate the urine or not as a measure of the tubular um, function, okay? So what you do is that we, we know that if you don't drink water, okay, um, the nephrons will reabsorb a lot of water and hence your urine is going to be concentrated. So that's all this um, test is about. So what you are going to do is that you just give the person, um, sorry, you, you deprive the person of water overnight. You, you don't make the person drink water, okay? Then in the morning, you, you take the person's urine sample and then you measure the, the uh, osmolality of the, of the urine, okay? If it's less than, uh, I mean, the osmolality must be more than 700 milliosmol per kg of water. This is the overnight. You can also do 24 hours, but this one is not comfortable. Okay, but um, um, for this one, the concentration, or sorry, the osmolality must be more than 800 milliosmols per kg. Okay, and I said the second function of the of the tubule is for um, for excreting or secreting H plus ions. So if, if you have more acid in your system, your kidneys must be able to secrete them. Okay, if your kidneys secrete those H plus ions, then that means that the, your urine is going to be acidic. Okay, good. So what's going to happen is that we we give the the the, the person Okay, this compound, ammonium chloride, which is, which when dissolved in your system um, becomes acidic, okay? The NH4 plus, you get NH4 plus, and then the, the H plus will be released from this, okay? Good. Then when you, when you, add, when you give the person this, then we, we expect that the kidneys should be able to secrete the H plus into the urine. Okay, so when you do that, you, you check the urine pH and it should be less than 5.3. We know that the, the normal urine pH is, is between 6 and 8, okay? But if you, you load the person with this compound, then the pH must be less than 5.3. If, if, you, if you are not getting a pH less than 5.3, then it means that the nephrons have a problem of secreting, um, how do you call it, H plus ion. We, we don't do this test for someone with liver failure because you are introducing ammonia into the person's system. And if the person's liver is failing, the person cannot convert the ammonia to urea. Note that um, urea is water soluble and it's less toxic as compared to raw ammonia, okay? So the liver converts the ammonia to urea. Okay, so if your liver is not functioning, you cannot perform, I mean, you cannot, um, how do you call it, uh, convert the ammonia to urea, okay? And the ammonia will stay in the system and then cause a lot of damage. Good. So there are, there are, there are other tests for, for tubular function, okay? You see, there are some people, you see, normally, there shouldn't be urine in, sorry, there shouldn't be glucose in your urine. So if you urinate and you find, and then we measure and then we, we see that so there, there is a lot of glucose in your system, okay? Um, we are worried because it could be that you, you have diabetes, okay? And th that one there is, is, norm, is normal because um, you, have high, you have high glucose in your blood, so, so your kidneys will exc excrete a lot of them, okay? Mm -hmm. But someone who is, who is not diabetic, 
and then we measure the, the person's urine and then the, the person has a lot of glucose in the person's urine then we are worried this time the problem can actually be from the glomerulus okay mm -hmm. so usually we, we do this for pregnancy so pregnancy we, we test their urine because in pregnancy they can get a certain condition we call preeclampsia which can affect the, the kidneys okay uh, and then pregnancy is also um, associated with diabetes we have diabetes of pregnancy okay so we check that so that's glucosuria good and there are, there are some conditions too that um, you you have high amount of amino acid in your urine so you have amino aciduria okay so this, these conditions the the is either the person has a lot of amino amino acids or the persons in the front cannot reabsorb the amino acid okay and one condition is called the system we have you have a lot of system in your urine okay good and there is also another condition where you have what is called specific tubular proteinuria where you have this compound this beta microglobulin okay and some other specific proteins like the benzions proteins in multiple myeloma okay so those ones will indicate certain conditions there is this condition that i want to talk about which is the Fanconi syndrome you see i'm sure you guys met a condition called Fanconi's Fanconi anemia okay or Fanconi anemia it's different from this one they are not the same okay for Fanconi syndrome what is happening there is that the proximal convoluted tubule cannot absorb any compounds at all. So all so you see when we started, I, I mentioned the function of the proximal convoluted tube that it absorbs bicarbonate, it absorbs sodium, it absorbs glucose, it absorbs amino acid. Okay. All these things cannot be absorbed. So for someone with with um, Fanconi's disease or Fanconi syndrome, the person's urine will have a lot of glucose a lot of amino acid, a lot of proteins, and then also they will have a lot of um, acid. Okay, good. So that's Fanconi syndrome. Good. Please, any questions so far? Are you guys there or I'm speaking to myself? No. Okay, good. Okay, now let's look at renal failure. Okay, now when, when you talk about renal failure, there are, there are two types. Okay, we have what is called the, the, the acute renal failure and then the chronic renal failure. And I'm sure, as, as you guys already know, and um, we, we no longer say acute renal failure, okay, but we say um, acute kidney injury, okay. Uh -huh. We no longer say acute renal failure, we say acute kidney injury. That's a new term. Or we could have chronic renal failure. Chronic renal failure or chronic kidney disease. So one of them is acute, one of them is chronic. The difference is that the acute one is reversible. Okay. But if you don't do anything about the acute one, then you get into the chronic one. The chronic one is irreversible. So that's that's the, the main difference. Okay. The, the causes of acute kidney injury and chronic kidney injuries are almost the same. Okay, with some few exceptions. So when we take acute kidney injury, which is which is reversible, okay. Um, for for this one, you guys have seen it in the pathology, so I I, I even want to skip it. I'm sure you know we have the pre-renal causes, the renal causes, and then the post-renal causes, right? So um, I think I can skip this session because you guys have already done it in pathology. Okay, so the pre-renal ones are the, the ones that okay before the kidneys. Okay, so this one is someone who is losing a lot of water. Okay, so for example, last time there was a patient on the ward who had diarrhea and then vomiting. The person was just vomiting and having diarrhea, losing a lot of fluid. Okay, then the next thing we, we, we realized is that the, the person's kidneys were failing. Okay, the person has run into acute kidney injury. So this caused there was nothing wrong with, with the kidney okay the thing is just ha happening somewhere else and it's affecting the kidney 
okay, or someone who is losing blood, hemorrhage. Okay, uh, so they can all cause perirenal uh, failure. Okay, and then we, we also have the post renal failure. So, post renal failure is usually caused by obstruction. When you, you, you have any anything obstructing the, the urinary tract, okay, so um, let, let's say you have um, an obstruction in the ureter, okay, if you have an obstruction in the ureter, the urine that you are producing cannot come down, so the urine will, will how do you call it, will back up and then it, it will affect the kidneys, okay. So those ones are the post renal conditions. So things like stones, clots, or cancers, okay, they can all block the the the, the urinary tracts, okay, and then cause what is called the post renal failure, okay. And and then we, we have the the renal cause. So for the renal cause, we can group them into two. We have the glomerular cause, and then the tubular interstitial cause, okay? So the glomerular cause, that was where we saw the glomerular nephritis, okay? All the causes of glomerular nephritis, okay? They can cause acute kidney, uh, they can cause acute kidney injuries, okay? And then the, the, the tubular interstitial ones, okay? Usually those ones are infections and then drugs, okay. Some, and um, um, I'm sure you, you guys saw that these drugs, okay, the the amino glycosides are nephrotoxic, okay. So they they cause damage to the tubules, okay. Uh -huh. And then we call this this damage acute tubular necrosis. So we have a condition called acute tubular necrosis, okay. Good. So. Let's see, what are the clinical features of someone with acute renal failure? So, from the, the clinical picture will be determined by what, by what is causing it, okay? So, if, uh, for example, someone who has had an accident or someone who is vomiting with diarrhea, okay, that one, um, the, the clinical picture will, will show, okay? Mm -hmm. But from, the, the science and then the investigations, what you are going to see is that the person's urine will be reduced. So we have two terms. Okay, we have oliguria and then anuria. When you say oliguria, it means that the person, within 24 hours, the person's urine is less than 500. Okay, I mean, from your slide, they said 400. Okay, males in 24 hours. We, we know that in 24 hours, the person must urinate about 1.3 to 1.5 liters. But here's the case that the person is only urinating about 400 mils. And there's also another term we call an anuria. When, when you talk about anuria, okay, we mean that the person is not bringing out any urine at all, okay? But at, at times, we, we say that when the person's urine is less than 50 mils in 24 hours, okay? Now, when you check the person's serum, you also notice that the urea levels are high, the creatinine levels are increased because they are staying in the blood. The kidney is supposed to excrete, the kidney cannot excrete it. So the serum urea and the serum, serum creatinine levels are increased, okay? And then hyperkalemia, as we noticed, um, um, the function of aldosterone is reabsorption of sodium at the expense of potassium. So if your kidney is failing, you cannot excrete potassium. So potassium will accumulate in your system and you have hypokalemia. You have, sorry, hyper, you have hyperkalemia. Okay. And good. And then um, if you remember, I said hyper, hyperkalemia will go with metabolic acidosis. Okay. I'm sure you, you remember that principle. Good. So, so usually, usually, let, let me just mention this. Usually, for people with acute kidney injury, as I said, 
if if you treat the underlying cause, they they come back to normal. Okay. So for example, for those with pre-renal failure, as we said, their main cause is that they are losing a lot of blood or they are losing a lot of fluid. Okay. So if you you give them fluid or you give them blood, they will come back to normal. Okay. So in the recovery process of acute kidney injury, there are three phases. Okay, we have the oliguric phase. This is the initial phases where the, the urine is very low. Okay, then they go to the diuretic phase. This phase they urinate a lot. Okay, then recovery phase. Then their urine come back to normal. Okay, someone's hand is up. Do you have a question? Okay. Let's go on. Right. So, yes. Please, for um, acute renal failure, you said it's when. Um, yeah, come again. Please, I, I, I can't hear you. Come again. You're I said for acute renal failure, you said it's when the urine produces less than 500, but in the slides it was less than 400. Yeah, that's, that's how do you call it? That's oliguria. Okay, oliguria. Yeah, I'm saying that in, in your slide is 500, but from, from our side, okay, in, in clinical practice, we, we use 500, okay. So, but you go with your slides, okay. Thank you. Yeah, it's 400. Yeah, I know 500, but in the slide is 400. Okay. Let's continue. Any, any further question? Okay, let's continue. So, so as I said, for the pre-renal failure, the management is that give the, give the patient fluid resources.